Hey everyone, the hybrid portion of this particular week we're going to continue our um, our discussion of financial statement analysis. Okay, so uh, in this particular video we'll talk about a couple of the different types of, uh, of re re uh, ratio types. Excuse me. In this particular case we're going to start with leverage ratios, right? So leverage ratios are a measure of how much debt the firm makes use of and how well they're using it. Okay, so we want to make sure that we're using some debt because there are advantages to that, but we also want to make sure we're not using too much because that could be a bad thing, right? So the reason we want to use debt is because it enables us to undertake bigger and better projects or scale existing projects that are good up into larger amounts, right? So if you imagine you could buy one book for $10 and sell it for 15 because you had $10 on hand, if you instead borrowed ninety dollars, you could buy ten books at ten dollars a piece, and then you could sell ten dollars or ten books at fifteen dollars a piece, right? And so at the end, you'd have a hundred and fifty dollars. You'd have to give some small amount to the bank, right? You have to give the hundred back that you borrowed plus maybe five dollars in interest, but you'd be left with forty-five dollars after the fact, as opposed to when you just used your own money, you had ten, and then you that got to fifteen, you only had a five-dollar gain. Right, so leverage can increase returns and make a good deal a great one, right? But we don't want too much of this because it can prevent us from being able to borrow to finance other projects. It can make investors worried about the riskiness of our firm, a lot of different things. So we want to make sure we have the right amount, and the leverage ratios help us figure out: um, Are we close to what is appropriate for our firm? Okay. So uh, the first one we want to look at is the debt to equity ratio. Right. And so this is a common ratio. Uh, we just compare the amount of debt, the total debt relative to the total equity, and we can either use book value or market value. Right. It doesn't matter which. Uh, we just have to be consistent. If we use book value of equity, we should use book value of debt and vice versa. Um, the one thing being that sometimes finding a market value of debt can be difficult because this stuff doesn't trade a whole lot like the equity does. Right. We can also look at debt to total capital. Right, so this is debt compared to equity plus debt, which is going to be assets. So total debt compared to total assets, which says what percentage of the firm is financed by debt. Right, you can also use book or market values here. Um, and this is going to have some important implications for the risk return of the stock. Right, a firm that is mostly debt, right, it has a high percentage financed by debt, means that not very much can go wrong to lower the value of the firm before the equity piece disappears. Right, so imagine if you finance a company entirely by debt. Even the smallest bad thing that happens is going to take you from positive valuation to negative valuation, and when you're in negative valuation, that's when you file for bankruptcy. So we don't want that to happen. Right, imagine you borrow $100 and start a $100 firm with this. If you make a mistake in the first week and the value of the firm declines to $95, suddenly you're $5 underwater and you have $95 of assets, but you owe $100. It's in your best interest to walk away at that point. And so you do. right? Or you file for bankruptcy to get out of having to pay back, etc., etc. It's a really bad outcome for everyone. So what we want to have is we want to have some equity there so that if some minor shock happens initially, we don't wipe out some of the value that would cause us to go to bankruptcy, right? So how much debt we use, what percentage of the firm financed by debt is going to have these important implications about the risk of the stock and the return that is then demanded. Okay. Uh, we also have this concept of net debt that we look at when we talk about leverage uh, because debt outstanding is important. But if you have $100 million in debt outstanding, but you have $100 million in cash on hand, you could pay that debt off at the blink of an eye. And so the outstanding debt that's really a risk for shareholders uh, is very drastically different. Right? So what we do is we subtract out any excess cash we have, the cash account. And we also tend to subtract out short-term investments because short-term investments are generally liquid enough that we feel like we can convert them to cash at full value on a moment's notice. Right, so using this net debt idea, where we just have the debt that's really at risk, right, we can look at the debt to enterprise value ratio by calculating the enterprise value, which is the market value of equity plus the net debt outstanding. Right, So market value of equity plus debt minus cash and cash equivalents. Um, 
And so we look at net debt relative to market value, which is important, plus net debt, um, which is the enterprise value. Right? So there's a way of looking at it like that. Right? Just another measure of leverage that the company makes use of. The last leverage ratio is the equity multiplier. Right? This is the total assets divided by the book value of equity. Right, so it says, based on the amount of equity that the owners put in, how big is the firm? The firm is X number of times larger than the amount investors originally invested in it. Right? So it helps us assess both how much, um, or it assesses how much leverage there is. Right? So if assets are three times the size of the book value of equity, right, that tells us something about the leverage. Okay. And we saw earlier in the example I talked about that leverage can amplify returns right, from using leverage, which can be good or bad. Right, so it's important for us to know this. Okay. So that is the, those are the leverage ratios. The next one that we want to talk about, the next type, is really the most important. This is the valuation ratios. As a finance person, this is the one that I care about most. And when people in finance talk about valuation, uh, the one here, price to earnings, is the one that people talk about most. Okay, Because this represents a multiple of the relationship between stock price, outstanding share price, and various fundamentals of the firm. Right. So it says, this is how much people are willing to pay. This is a dollar figure that people are willing to pay per dollar unit of whatever fundamental we want to look at. And the two most common, really the one most common is price to earnings, but if earnings are negative, oftentimes they'll look at price to sales. Okay. Uh, but we'll focus mostly on price to earnings. And this is measured as either market capitalization of the firm, so the total value of all the equity as a function of total earnings. Right. Or we can look at the individual share price. So instead of just instead of the entire equity piece, a single equity price divided by the earnings on a per share basis. Right. These will either one of these calculations will give us the exact same answer, and they'll both tell us how much are people willing to pay for a current dollar of earnings. All right. So that's the the price to earnings ratio. Right. This is important because we use it to assess whether or not a stock is over or undervalued. Okay. If the P-E ratio is really high, right, the P-E ratio is 1,000. That means people are paying $1,000 of their money right now for a single dollar of future earnings. Okay. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people might do this, but the big one is they think the company is going to grow. Right? So even though there might only be a dollar of current earnings, they think there's going to be a lot more earnings in the future. Right? But a P-E ratio of 1,000 is pretty high. It's going to be tough to meet the kind of earnings expectations in terms of growth to justify a price that high, right? at least generally. Um, so what does the P-E ratio do? It compares the price people are paying relative to the earnings generated each, pri each period. So it's how much people are paying right now for each dollar of current earnings. Okay. This is how we calculate it, either market cap over net in Come, which is the total earnings. Yeah, there we go. Um, or we look at the share price divided by earnings per share. Earnings per share is total earnings divided by the number of shares outstanding, which is the same thing as net income divided by shares outstanding, right? Earnings per share, market cap. Okay. So we need to do these things. This is the slide you want to look at. Now, P ratios come in many shapes and sizes and numbers, right? Uh, and there's no one right number. Like I said uh, before, is that we need to compare these against other companies and the firm itself through history. But just for scale to show you the differences that can pop up here, we've got Citigroup at 9.5 for its PE ratio, Verizon at 14.4, Apple at 21.5, Amazon at 82.4, which is pretty high, and then a company like Square at over 1,000. Right, so that means currently people who are investing in Square are paying more than $1,000 for every dollar of current earnings that's available. Okay, that's a lot. Now, that's because people seem to think that Square is one of the ways that it's a great uh, money transfer service, and um, they think it's got a lot of potential, so they think there's a lot of growth, and they think earnings are going to grow a lot, and so that's why they're paying so much for it. 
right? Whether or not that's true, only time will tell, and you can have your own opinion on it. Uh, but they vary dramatically based on the industry. We see that technology is consistently higher than things like telecommunications or banking. I said oftentimes PE can be used as a measure of growth. The reason is because we think about the PE ratio relative to the growth of the firm. Okay, so oftentimes we look at this in terms of the PEG ratio, which is price to earnings divided by the growth rate of the firm. Right? And this is acceptable. A higher PE is acceptable if, 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 if a higher earnings growth is expected. Right? Because there might only be a current a dollar of current earnings right now, but that dollar might grow into several thousand dollars of current earnings in the future if the company has explosive growth. And so paying a thousand dollars for a dollar now, when I know I'm going to get ten thousand dollars in five years, that doesn't seem so far-fetched anymore. Right, so PEG ratio can help us assess this, but it would require us to know the long-run growth rate of the firm, which we generally aren't going to know. But what we can do is we can assume that PEG should be one. Right, factoring in growth, the PE ratio should roughly be one. You'd pay a dollar of current value for a dollar of current earnings if you take growth out of the equation. Right, if the company wasn't going to grow at all anymore, if you account for all the growth, a dollar today is worth a dollar today. So PEG ratio should be one. Right, based on the fact that PEG is one, or it should be one we can say PE ratio represents the growth rate that the market expects for the company, right? Because you've got PE ratio divided by growth rate. So if these two numbers are the same thing, if this is 13, then the growth rate is 13%, then PEG would be one, right? So we can swap, the, uh, swap this in and solve for it, right? So if I know PE ratio divided by X must be one, then whatever the P.E. ratio is, the growth rate must be the same, right? So we can look at the P.E. ratio as an approximation for what the market expects the growth rate of the firm to be. If the P.E. ratio is 12, we expect growth rate to be 12%. If the P.E. ratio is 35, we expect the growth rate to be 35%. So jumping back a slide real quick here, this suggests that the market might expect 9.5% growth for Citi, 14% for Verizon, 21 for Apple, 82 for Amazon, and 1,000% growth for Square. Right. Now, this is only one interpretation of the P.E. ratio, so there are other factors that are going to go into this, so it's not a clear-cut interpretation, but it is one way to go ahead and look at it. Okay. Now, those are the ratios when you have to do them. Uh, there's an example here in the notes looking at Walmart versus Target. We're not going to go through that. You can look through this on your own. The numbers come from the balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flows included in the notes. Right. That'll be a good place to end part one. Uh, the remainder of the notes will be covered in part two of the hybrid piece for this week. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time.